today we're gonna discuss um, how to perform um, exploratory factor analysis using this software uh, Jamovi. Jamovi is a free software uh, you can download it install it in your PC uh, and it can um, perform uh, exploratory factor analysis uh, given a particular data set um, so here is a list of the things that we are supposed to do um, to conduct the analysis. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is to convert text responses to numbers. So this is our data set. This is actually just a sample data set. Uh, this is the uh, data that we will analyze later on. But for the purposes of uh, doing, uh, doing this task, converting text, text responses to numbers uh, I provided some <clears throat> an example here um, now I, I mentioned this because sometimes when we use online um, online platforms to gather our data such as Google Forms sometimes the output might be uh, in this form uh, and uh, clearly we cannot uh, perform factor analysis uh, when uh, we have data that looks like this so we have to convert this into um, numbers right? so to do this we simply perform uh, our basic uh, find and replace function uh, so we find um, so in, in this case the options range from never rarely sometimes almost always and always so well depending on uh, depending on the instruction uh, uh, coming from the scale uh, hypothetically in this case let's just say that the authors told us that uh, never is scored as one rarely is scored as two sometimes is scored as three almost always is four and always is five so let's use that guide and um, let's find let's say for example never and replace it with a value of one click on find all uh, replace all so you will notice that uh, those uh, responses uh, that are never are now one um, let's replace rarely with the value of 2 find all replace all uh, let's replace sometimes with uh, 3 find all replace all almost always let's make that four and lastly always make it five okay so now uh, we have uh, we've co uh, effectively converted our text responses into numbers okay so assuming that uh, this is our final output so this is uh, the data set that we will deal with um, the first thing that you have to do is to identify uh, these cases and assign id numbers uh, to them so uh, these id numbers are our participants so there are 224 participants um, for this particular um, data collection um, <clears throat> now uh, so, so each row are the responses of participant number, of, in this case, participant number one to all of the items. So there. So we have uh, P1 to P13 and A1 to A16. So all in all, 13 plus 16, we have about uh, 29 items for um, 
this particular skill. By the way, to put some context, um, we are performing exploratory factor analysis in this case uh, to aid in instrument development. Uh, to give you a bit uh, of a background, uh, this scale is meant to uh, to measure uh, procrastination. Um, literature suggests that there are two kinds of procrastination. One is passive procrastination, and the other one is active procrastination. Uh, passive procrastination basically is your typical procrastination, uh, wherein students delay uh, helplessly, whereas active procrastination apparently is a kind of procrastination that is more deliberate. Some students feel that they perform better under pressure, so they delay uh, the task as a strategy uh, in order to uh, generate uh, optimal um, optimal results. So the, the items here labeled as P, P1, P2, uh, P2 that's uh, P3, not PE, uh, refer to the items uh, that measures uh, passive procrastination and the items labeled as A supposedly are items that measure active procrastination. Okay. So the first thing that we have to do, uh, we are in Excel right now when we are preparing our data, is to clean our data. Okay. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is to reverse uh, scores if necessary. So if there are some items that are negatively uh, negatively phrased uh, and um, you need to reverse score them uh, so we have to we have to do that now um, okay so let's say for example uh, p3 is negatively phrased uh, phrased on that item so we have to reverse score that so what we do is we insert a column uh, so reverse scoring simply means that um, if the range of possible responses is 1 to 6, uh, 6 is converted into 1, 5 is converted into 2, 4 is converted into 3, 3 to 4, uh, 2 to 5, and uh, 1 to 6, and so forth and so on. Okay. Um, so uh, one effective way of um, reversing the score is to do this so if the highest possible response is six uh, we have to think of the number that is higher than six so that's basically seven and enter this formula equals seven minus uh, that score which in this case is four so four is converted into three uh, double click uh, and the rest of the items are uh, the rest of the scores are converted so la let's label this as uh, uh, p3 r uh, to remind ourselves that this is a uh, a reverse uh, reverse scored okay um, now we can remove this but before we do that let's copy this and then paste as values okay. uh, because when if we don't do that if i erase this then uh, these values will not or, or the how do you call that the formula will not uh, produce these values so we can remove our uh, uh, that row uh, another one um, so let's say for example a3 is also reverse scored so let's do that again so same procedure seven minus this equals three okay label it as a3 r highlight everything copy control c copy and then paste as value and then let's delete this column okay. 
so we have now uh, reverse uh, the scores of those items that are negatively phrased uh, the next thing that we have to do is um, check if there are missing values okay. so to do that um, we can use a particular formula uh, equals open parentheses count close parentheses um, highlight except for the ID number uh, close parentheses there are 29 items so divided by the 29 close parentheses times 100 enter wrong uh, how many items do we have Oh, there. That's that's what that's a problem. Twenty nine. Okay. So a hundred percent. We need to say um, there are no missing values for this particular row. Double click that, and then let's sort it from smallest to highest. Uh, yes, we want to expand the selection, uh, and there. Okay. So this particular person, uh, participant number thirty five missed a couple of items um, participant number 25 missed item number uh, item a6 and participant 62 missed item uh, p12 okay. now <clears throat> uh, so what do we do with the missing values uh, so for as long as uh, only uh, less than 5% of the values are missing per participant, uh, there is a remedy for that. But for this one, um, there's nothing much we can do but to remove this participant. We cannot use um, his data. Okay, so we've deleted that. Okay, so what do we do with this missing value? Uh, well, there are two uh two things that uh, i've seen done uh, by others one is to replace this with the mean of the scores from this column so if i highlight this um, it will show me the average here so i can use that uh, the other one is we can compute for the mean of the responses for all items that pertain to uh, active procrastination so i think we can use this if we have some a priori um, a priori hypothesis no, uh, as to whether which items uh, would load into what particular factor so i'll i'll go with option number two so compute for the mean of the scores of all scores pertaining to uh, active procrastination and use that to replace the missing value so average close parentheses then highlight all values um, that are responses to active procrastination items so there 4.6 um, so we round it off so 4.6 uh, that's a 5 so maybe we can replace this missing value with a 5 okay all right now for the other one uh, so the other one is missing an item under passive procrastination so we do the same uh, but this time instead of getting the average uh, score uh, in active procrastination we get the average score in passive procrastination so equals average okay up to there p13 click enter so there 
p uh, sorry 3.41 so let's round that off and let's just say that we replace that with uh, 3 instead okay all right so uh, we can remove uh, these columns we no longer need them um, and we can sort again our participants according to their ID okay <clears throat> okay um, so so there we have it uh, we have uh, imputed the missing values the next one is to examine variability in response uh, of each respondent to check if there are some individuals who were not engaged. Um, sometimes when uh, participants answer questionnaires, sometimes they do not read and they just um, 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 guess. Uh, and one indicator of guessing is if all of their responses are the same for all of the questions. Um, so if responses are the same for all of the questions, that means to say that there is no variability. So if a participant answers one all throughout, that means to say that there's no variation in his response. So one way to identify whether or not there is zero variation, meaning to say the participant responded the same, uh, the same, res uh, the same, um, response no, all throughout is to compute for um, each of the participants scores standard deviation so to do that let's enter the formula for standard deviation equals st dev parentheses and then highlight okay so excluding excluding the id number enter okay then uh, double click to uh, compute for the rest let's highlight it and let's sort it from smallest to largest expand yes and there so there is zero standard deviation which means to say that participant number 14 answered similarly throughout so just a bunch of ones all throughout so this is a good indicator that uh, this participant did not read, uh, was too lazy to read, and probably did not care about the, the, the questionnaire. Uh, and uh, because of this, uh, we might, you know, we may remove participant number 14. Uh, his response do not benefit um, our, our purpose. Um, participants 1 and 3 have relatively low uh, standard deviation, meaning to say uh, their responses are pretty similar all throughout. Uh, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt and let's just uh, retain them for the meantime. Okay, So let's sort them back again uh, according to their ID number. So we have now, uh, so our data is relatively uh, clean, uh, I would say. All right, so to analyze uh, factor analysis in Jamovi, uh, let's save this Excel spreadsheet. So click on File, Save As. Uh, save it as CSV. So let's save um, our file as uh, .csv. Say yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So let's now go to Jamovi. So this is the Jamovi interface. Again, it's a free uh, software you can download it uh, install it in your PC so let's load our data
So this is our data. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is our data set. Okay. So um <clears throat> So the first thing that we have to do is to uh, check the normality of um, of um, the responses to each of the items. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, so how do we do that? So let's go to uh, this expl exploration and then descriptives. Let's throw in everything to here only. Okay. Um, this will take a while. So the, the basic uh, rule uh, to check for normality, specifically normality that is acceptable for EFA according to Klein, is that the skewness should at least be less than 2 and that the kurtosis should be less than 8. So that's what we will look for. Still running. There. Uh, we do not need the median. Uh, we need. Uh, we don't need the maximum. The minimum. We need the uh, skewness and the uh, kurtosis. All right. So let's give the software some time to run. there so let's check hmm. so p1 so this is uh, uh, skewness measures and this is the kurtosis measures so again skewness nothing beyond 2 and kurtosis nothing above 8 okay so let's just have a quick look here All right, relatively, relatively normal. What we have here above one, that's okay. What we flag is above eight, according to Klein. All right, so we're good. We're good with the, the normality of our data set. Um, okay, so the next one is to check if the sample size is adequate um, using the uh, KMO uh, statistic uh, and to check if the correlations of the items are sufficient during, uh, using uh, Barlett's test of sphericity. Okay. okay, so to do that, let's go to factor. Um, we will be doing exploratory factor analysis. There are other analyses you can make, such as PCA or confirmatory factor analysis, all of which are similar to exploratory factor analysis, but they serve um, their respective purposes. Uh, in this analysis or in this uh, tutorial, we are focusing on uh, exploratory factor analysis. So let's click on that. Okay, so before we run the analysis, um, before we uh, essentially throw in all of these items over to this side, let's try to um, check 
uh, some boxes that uh, uh, we need so a while ago uh, we said that uh, we want to check the sample size adequacy and the uh, sufficiency of the correlations so we want to check Barlett's test of sphericity and KMO um, it will not run anything yet because we haven't uh, uh, we haven't transferred these items to over to this side um, okay now I'm, I'm gonna explain it later on so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna select uh, a couple of options here uh, for rotation, uh, we want we want uh, oblimin for factor loadings. Let's increase this to uh, 0.4. Um, okay. Uh, let's leave uh, this at uh, the default. I want to see the scree plot. Uh, what else? So basically, those are the initial options that um, I will I will select. Okay. So let's now highlight all of these items and then transfer it over to the other side. Okay. All right. So the software is running the analysis. This will take some time. So again, uh, for um, for the adequacy of sample size, the, the KMO must be uh, greater than uh, 0 0.05. And uh, um, to check for the sufficiency of the intercorrelations of the items, the Barlett's test of sphericity, uh, the p-value should be less than 0 0.05. All right. Okay, <clears throat> so here is our KMO measure. So the overall KMO is 0.927, which is well ab above our uh, 0.5 um, minimum. So that means to say that our sample is adequate. We have about 224 participants, so that's okay. And then for Barlett's test of sphericity, uh, we note that the p-value is less than 0 0.001. So that means to say that the intercorrelations of our items is also sufficient to run factor analysis. Okay. Now the next thing that we have to do is to determine the number of factors. So uh, factor analysis is a data reduction uh, technique, uh, meaning to say that um, given uh, a number of items, um, how are they meaningfully uh, grouped? Um, or what are the factors that influence the way participants respond to these items? Um, I mentioned a while ago that we are looking at, at, at least at the theoretical level, we are looking at two factors here. One is uh, passive procrastination and the other one is active procrastination but statistically how do we check uh, for the number of factors there are a couple of options here the first one is called the uh, Kaiser's criterion uh, which basically uh, suggests that uh, all eigenvalues um, greater than one um, uh, that will be the basis for the number of factors Another one is the scree plot, uh, and this is usually my go-to, uh, my go-to uh, in determining the number of factors. But most importantly, uh, whatever information we get from the scree plot or the Kaiser's criterion should also be informed by theory. So let's take a look at the scree plot. So, so the thing to look for at the scree plot is uh, what we call as the inflection point. Uh, the inflection point, uh, given this um, graph, uh, is the point where uh, the data seem to uh, the, the the point or the the so called the elbow. So, if there's a sh sort of a sharp um, angle 
uh, into uh, this line or that is our inflection point uh, and I, I can say that this seems to be our elbow this seems to be our inflection point and this inflection point informs us that we have um, two factors so one and then two get that one and then two so prior to the inflection point or you know, judging from the inflection point there seem to be uh, three uh, two factors rather okay. and that uh, coincides with what theory says or at least know uh, what we are coming from we're trying to develop an instrument that measures two kinds of procrastination uh, passive procrastination and active procrastination so um, we will go with uh, what the scree plot and what the theory is saying um, you will notice however here that there are three factors and that is because the basis for these three factors is um, at, at default uh, based on the so-called parallel analysis so parallel analysis is basically uh, the intersection between this uh, and and this so this is sort of a based on uh, some kind of simulated data and this is based on our actual data uh, and it's saying that there are three you now because there are three points now right before uh, the intersection uh, but we will not uh, rely on that and we will rely on what the scree plot is saying and what our theory is saying so instead of um, instead of uh, relying on the default let's click on uh, fix the number of factors and let's set it to two uh, so it's recalculating now so we are forcing the analysis to organize all of the items under two factors What happened? I said two. Hmm. Something's wrong. Recalculating. There. Okay. Um now we have suppressed so these values are what you call as loadings loadings okay um and we said here hide loadings below 0 0.04 which is our cutoff so if if we do not specify this um let's see what happens oh okay so if if we if we say uh, hide loadings uh, below zero so uh, basically it will show all of the all of the loadings okay. uh, but we wanna we wanna uh, set a uh, cut off so that we can see uh, clearly which items load to which factor so let, again let's uh, set it back to point zero uh, point four rather okay so there you have it so these are the, the loadings it's looking pretty nicely you can notice that most of the items pertaining to passive procrastination load uh, into factor two and most of the items in uh, under active procrastination loads into uh, factor one so it seems that or at least judging from this it seems that uh, there is some support you know, that uh, passive procrastination uh, and active procrastination are indeed separable and in that the items that we have prepared for them do load where they should be 
Um, however, we seem to have a problem here. So P9 is, this item is loading both on factor 1 and factor 2. So that is, um, that is what we call as cross-loading. Oh, I forgot to talk about the method of rotation. A while ago, we set uh, uh, the rotation method to oblimin. Um, there are a couple of other options here, by, uh, like Farimax, uh, Quartimax, Promax, Oblimin. Um, we're choosing Oblimin because um, uh, we are favoring, uh, um, what do you call this, an oblique type of rotation. Oblimin is an oblique type of rotation. And oblique rotation is usually used when we think that... Um, that the two factors or the factors are correlated in some way now because these are both types of procrastinate procrastination i'm guessing that to some degree active procrastination and passive procrastination is uh, are rather correlated with one another uh, and for that reason uh, we are using this um if if you think that your factors are not correlated um, you may choose varimax although there are some uh, people uh, who, who suggest that um, it's okay to use oblimin uh, even if you think that um, your factors are not correlated i've also seen some individuals who prefer uh, pro max rotation over, uh, over oblimin rotation uh, but for the meantime or in this in this tutorial let's just use oblimin okay so going back so we have here cross loadings now what do we do with cross loading items um now since we want to make a we our intention is to develop a scale um our conclusion usually is to eliminate uh, items that cross load so p9 seems to be problematic so we can take out p9 so choose p9 and transfer it back okay so it, it will run again okay so there you go um, now in in some cases uh, once you remove one item other items would start cross-loading uh, to both factors so basically you have to do th uh, this process this iteration uh, until you get a clean separation between items that are supposedly measuring factor 1 and items that are supposedly measuring factor 2. Okay. So after that, the next thing that we have to do is to interpret the factors that emerged. Um, it's easy to, to do so uh, because... Um, Prior to the analysis, we we already suggested that some of these items or particular items are meant to measure passive procrastination and other items are meant to measure active procrastination. So basically these items, uh, uh, to interpret them, are items that measure passive procrastination whereas these items um, we would inter interpret as items that measure active procrastination okay so there you go so that is exploratory factor analysis the last thing that we have to do did i mention it here i did not mention it here the last thing that we have to do is to check the reliability or in, uh, internal consistency of the of the scales so we have uh, two subscales so let's check the reliability of both scales. So to do that, let's go to factor again, click on reliability analysis. Okay. So the default here is Cronbach's alpha, which is what we are what we typically use. So let's highlight all of the P items, those that measure passive procrastination except for p9 which we dropped a while ago let's transfer it there 
Okay. So the result suggests that the Cronbach's alpha is 0.869. Is this good? Yes. Um, literature suggests that the Cronbach's alpha should be greater than uh, point, point 0.8. Okay. So with a Cronbach's alpha of 0 0.869, that is... Um, good measure of reliability for our passive procrastination uh, subscale. Um, let's run that again this time for active procrastination. So let's highlight all items. We did not drop any in our active procrastination items. So let's transfer everything. Okay, it's computing. All right, so the p-value is, oh sorry, the Cronbach's alpha is 0.955, which is equally good. Um, so it's higher than 0.8. So given that, that means to say that both of our subscales, our passive procrastination subscale and our active procrastination subscales, uh, the items are internally consistent, both, uh, both for the subscales. So that's it. I hope that uh, this tutorial was a bit helpful uh, in your um, research projects, particularly projects that are involving skill development. Thank you.